Welcome everyone to my online course for research methods in psychology. My name is Frank Lociavo and I am your instructor. I have a few interesting things to discuss with you, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. It's time for us to begin a new chapter of our course, and this is an important chapter because it introduces a framework for evaluating all research based on three key types of research claims, frequency claims, association claims, and causal claims, and four key types of validities, internal validity, external validity, construct validity, and statistical validity. Those terms might not make a lot of sense to you right now, but give yourself a break. We just started talking about this chapter. We'll begin covering all that stuff in the next video. But for now, in this video, I'll discuss variables. We need to understand variables to understand everything else we'll be discussing this semester. As you'll see, variables are the core unit, the basic building block of psychological research. All right, let's get to work. So what is a variable? Actually, you probably remember learning about variables in your statistics class, but let's review. A variable is simply something we can measure, and the measurement values vary. In other words, the measurement values differ. Let's discuss a few examples to make sure that's clear. The average brain weight of a species, for example, is a variable because weight values differ for different species. In this example, there are two variables. One variable is the type of species, sperm whale, human being, dog, and the other variable is brain weight. Those values that we measure are often called levels. In this example, we can see three different levels of species listed and three different levels of weight. That said, for both variables, there are many other possible levels that can exist. IQ is another example of a variable. Here we see IQ measurements for nine different people, and we see several different levels of that IQ variable listed. When we collect data from people, we often want to know who they are. So, for example, if I were studying college students, I'd probably want to know their class rank. That's a variable because different students have different class ranks freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. We used to ask about biological sex, male or female, but now we're more likely to ask about gender, which is more personally defined. For example, researchers might ask, do you describe yourself as a man, a woman, or in some other way? In this particular case, the variable is gender, and we can see three levels listed. Of course, we could split that last level into several other response options. Technically speaking, a constant isn't a variable because its value doesn't vary between measurements we take. Instead, the value remains constant. For example, if I'm measuring IQ of college students, the IQs I measure would vary, so IQ would be a variable. But if I were to measure student status, each of my participants would be classified as a student. In other words, the measurements would be constant. The data wouldn't vary. So in that particular research study, student status would be a constant. So in a sense, a constant is a variable with just one level. Now that I've refreshed your memory about variables, it's worth noting that researchers either measure or manipulate variables, and the distinction is important. When conducting research, most variables are simply measured. For example, the average brain weight of a species is a measured variable. In other words, once you gain access to a sperm whale's brain, you measure its weight using some sort of scale. When I study IQs of college students, I simply measure their IQ, typically using a standardized intelligence test. And when I'm interested in studying gender, I simply measure each person's response to a question about how they describe themselves. In each of these examples, measuring a variable is just a matter of recording its natural level on some sort of measurement device such as a digital scale, or an intelligence test, or a survey question. In each of those examples, as a researcher, I had no control over those variables. I simply measured them. Manipulated variables are different. In fact, manipulated variables will open a whole new world of possibilities for us. That's because, as a researcher, I control manipulated variables, typically by assigning research subjects to different levels of the variable. Let's discuss a simple example. 
We'll assume I've developed a new drug for treating depression, and I need to test it to determine if it's effective. So first I'd recruit depressed people who are interested in participating in a research study. Then I'd randomly assign half of them to one group. They'd receive the new drug. I'd assign the other half of the participants to a second group. They'd receive a placebo. In this situation, the variable I'm manipulating is treatment status, and it has two levels. One level of treatment status involves getting the new drug. The second level of treatment involves getting a placebo. As the researcher in charge of the study, I manipulated that variable. I determined, via a random process, who received the new drug and who received the placebo. So clearly, that's a manipulated variable. After several weeks, I'd test everyone from both groups to see how depressed they are. Because I'd just be measuring their current level of depression, that variable, which we'll call depression level, is simply a measured variable. So I hope you're seeing the difference between measured and manipulated variables. As I mentioned, manipulated variables will become very important to us. They'll allow us to design powerful research studies. By the way, it's worth noting that some variables cannot be manipulated. Think of the measured variables we discussed earlier. Can we manipulate brain weight? Can we assign some species to have a large, heavy brain and other species to have a small, lightweight brain? No, we can't. That's a variable that can only be measured. What about gender? Can we manipulate it in a research study? I don't think we can. Even though some people transition between genders, it's not something we, as researchers, can assign people to do. It wouldn't be practical. It wouldn't be ethical. Unless you overthink it, manipulating gender in a research study doesn't really make much sense. It's a strange example to discuss, but I hope you see my point. Not all variables are good candidates for manipulation in a research study. Regardless of whether we measure or manipulate a variable, at some point, we need to define what each variable represents. And there are a few ways we can do that. So let's begin with a good example. If you're watching this video, you're probably a student. And as a student, you've probably given quite a bit of thought to student achievement. Well, researchers have also looked closely at student achievement. In fact, many people who teach and conduct research study student achievement. I'm one of those people. Anyway, student achievement is a conceptual variable. In other words, student achievement is a relatively abstract concept. You know, what does it actually mean? There's nothing concrete about the term. The term student achievement doesn't imply we're measuring anything in particular, although I assume most of us think of grades when we think about the concept student achievement. My point is that if you're going to measure student achievement, you first need to define what it means. So we might start with a conceptual definition. Conceptually, we might define student achievement as doing well in school. Okay, that's great, but it doesn't get us very far. Because as researchers, as we're planning a research study, we need to know exactly what to measure. Specifically, we need to know exactly what to measure to collect meaningful data on student achievement. In this case, we might further define student achievement in terms of grades. That's reasonable. That's measurable. For example, we might create a brief questionnaire for students and then ask them directly, what grades do you typically earn at school? All A's, mostly A's and B's, mostly B's, etc. That's one way we can measure student achievement. So in this situation, we'd say that we're operationally defining student achievement in terms of self-reported grades in school. That could suit our purposes, but that's not the only way we could operationally define student achievement. For example, to get more precise, more accurate data about grades, we might operationally define student achievement based on a student's official school records, their academic transcripts. Or, if we're interested in more nuanced information about student achievement, we might ask teachers to share their observations, their opinions, of each student's performance in class. These are all valid ways to operationally define or operationalize student achievement. Operational definitions help us define the specific research operations we need to follow to collect our data. 
Here are a few other good examples. Feel free to pause the video to check them out. This table has several more good examples. Again, feel free to pause the video to check them out. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because I'll have more to say about research methods in the next video.